Hi, I'm Patrick Disney and welcome to Western Window, a show made by students here at Western Washington University. Today we're going to get a glimpse at some innovative research in alternative fuels, check out an unusual psychology experiment, and experience some truly imaginative recycling. So join us as we explore our world through Western Window. Western's Vehicle Research Institute is known for its award-winning car designs, but don't let the sleek exteriors fool you. The VRI strives for maximum fuel efficiency. Now, you might have heard about their recent success in developing a car that gets over 100 miles to the gallon. <laughs> now, they're working on a car powered by cows. I'm Eric Lenhart. I'm the director of the Vehicle Research Institute here in the Engineering Technology Building on Western Washington University's campus. We are currently working on biomethane. And the idea of biomethane is that we can take uh, waste from animals, dairy cows in particular. And in Whatcom County, we're among the top 1% of all counties in the nation with regard to dairy cow population. This uh, 60, 80,000 cows are capable of producing somewhere between 9 and 20 million gasoline gallons of equivalent energy per year. Right now, the dairy cows, uh, their waste causes an environmental burden for dairy farmers. And it's one that the Department of Ecology, both locally in the state and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency on a federal level, are trying to work on. The methane, as we currently deal with the waste, produces 23 times on a mass basis the global warming potential. So it's a tremendous greenhouse gas emission in our region. It also produces uh, fecal coliform and other kinds of algae blooms in the water supplies. So all of those kind of environmental issues are things that by using this as a fuel could make the economics of cleaning up the farms more desirable for farmers. What the farmers need to do is install anaerobic digesters to digest this waste. But the challenge is the capital cost of the anaerobic digester. And right now what we're doing in this county is we have one anaerobic digester and it's producing gas. It's a raw biogas. It has methane in it, it has hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide. It's burned in a V12 that's been diesel engine that's been converted to run on the gas. This one farm, the Vanderhoek Dairy, it produces enough gas to have the equivalent of around 200,000 gasoline gallons equivalent per year. Dairy cows do their business in one spot. Their waste is scraped into a sump. It's pumped into a holding facility. It can be pumped directly into the anaerobic digester, and then it can be processed. You can run the gas through a refinery unit, compress it so it's at a high density, and then put it into your cars. So it can all be done on the farm. What's different about our research institute is that we tie in the advanced vehicle, an advanced parallel hybrid vehicle with the biomethane and the biofuels research. Our Viking 32 vehicle, our blue car, uh, it gets 50 miles per gallon. The yellow car behind me, it's designed to get 100 miles per gallon. These kind of highly fuel efficient cars are what's needed when you start going to biofuels. Nobody else has done that. We're the first school to run the cars on biomethane on a hybrid vehicle. Our research facility, with the use of undergraduate students, with the way that we've been able to leverage funding from private and public facilities, has been able to have a research impact far greater than the amount of dollars that have actually been in the facility. There's a multiplier effect with Western, with these undergraduate students, that it's much greater than what you can find at other pure research institutions and, frankly, at pure research organizations, at corporations. So we're roughly one-tenth the cost. It's a pretty impressive track record that we've been able to do right here at, at Western Washington University. Welcome back to the studio. Eric, as director of the Vehicle Research Institute, you have to be extremely excited about the direction that it's going. Can you give us any updates in terms of what the methane project is, is uh, where it's headed right now? Absolutely, Patrick. We just have gotten the Bel Air Charters Airporter shuttle bus running on natural gas 
It's providing service between Ferndale, Bellingham, and the Seattle-Tacoma International Airport. And it's running on natural gas from our refueling station at the Vanderhoek Dairy. Oh, that's fantastic. So uh, um, can you tell me a little bit about what's going on up at the dairy itself? And what's really exciting about this is, you know, in Whatcom County, we've got 50,000 dairy cows. We're one of the top producers of dairy milk in the nation. And so right at the Vanderhoek Dairy, we've got about 667 head of cattle on two different farms. You know, cows pose a lot of uh, environmental challenges for farmers because of this waste stream. We have to worry about water quality, air mm -hmm. quality. Mm -hmm. Can you talk just a little bit about uh, uh, the positive transitions you're able to make with this besides the methane fuel? Absolutely. So the anaerobic digester itself mm -hmm. is able to produce three product streams. One is the biogas that we're interested in producing for methane gas, mm -hmm. but we also have a, a liquid that is the fertilizer that Washington State University is working on developing that. And that liquid gets spread on the fields, and it's, uh, with, it's free from any kind of pathogens, so we don't have a water quality issue. And then there's also a solid byproduct, which can be used by the cows as a bedding compound, a peat moss substitute, or a uh, potting soil. It's good. It makes a really good base soil for growing plants. We're really working on finishing our refinery so we can run continuously, producing 60 to 100,000 gasoline gallon equivalents of fuel every year. And that would be biomethane fuel. So that would be from the cows. We're not quite there yet. We have a few more systems to develop. But once we do that, I hope it can serve as a model for the rest of Whatcom County and, frankly, the nation, um, because we need to start using these bio gas resources and running vehicles on biogas as a substitute for petroleum fuels. Um, because they, they allow us this great environmental benefit, we can reduce global warming, but they also can help us wean off of imported fuels. So that gives another great benefit to the fuel. As a lay person, I'm really curious what you think in terms of uh, where we are headed mm, as a culture, maybe even globally, with not only fuels, but uh, what, are we, what are cars going to look like in 15, 20, 30 years from now? Well, that's a great question. And I think I look at the world and I see, for example, the North Slope of Alaska. We have 2.2 mar million barrels a day being produced there when it first opened up. And now we're down to 700,000 barrels a day. So I know that the supply of easy hydrocarbon liquid fuel is diminishing. We've probably reached our peak in terms of global production in that fuel, so we've got to look for other solutions. And that means for personal transportation, you know, we've got to look at more walking, more mass transit. We have to look at more electric vehicles for a private commuting. Around town, we're only going 20, 40 miles a day. For our larger vehicles, we need to look at natural gas as a way to move our trucks across the country, and that'll take the pressure off of diesel and gasoline fuels. So those are all things that I see happening, and they're starting to happen now. Um, you know, we've got the leaf coming out, and they're hoping to produce 10,000 units of that this year. That's a drop in the bucket, but hopefully we keep building that momentum. Mm -hmm. And do you see in terms of vehicle design, obviously there's going to have to be adaptations made for the fuel sources themselves, but um, uh, other innovations finding their way into the de vehicle design? Absolutely. You know, it makes no sense to run around in 6,000-pound vehicle carrying <laughs> a 200-pound person. Uh, this just makes no sense. We've got to get our vehicles. Really, our personal vehicles should probably be 1,500 pounds, which is about what, you know, a little bit heavier than a Model T weighed. And it can be done with advanced composites. We've demonstrated this. We can meet the safety requirements. But we just, can't ha we just can't carry our whole office around with us every time we want to go take a trip. And then, you know, we use our vehicle just a few minutes a day, and then it sits parked all day. Yeah. So it's not a good use of resources. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it is such an exciting program. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. Eric Lenhart from the Vehicle Research Institute. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for more Western Window.
The VRI isn't the only place where innovative research is happening here at Western. With a little help from a unicycling clown, the psychology department has discovered some pretty definitive conclusions about the dangers of distractions while talking on a cell phone. If you were talking on your cell phone, would you see this clown? According to a Western Washington University study, most students surveyed did not. The study, conducted by Dr. Ira Hyman and his senior seminar psychology class, was an attempt to study the effects of inattentional blindness. The results of the study show that while only a quarter of cell phone users noticed the unicycling clown in Red Square, half of the individuals not using their cell phones and a contrasting 75% of students walking in pairs did take notice. Kind of historically, a lot of the studies that have to do with inattention blindness have used a novel stimuli like that. Um, you know, someone dressed up in an animal suit or something like that. And we were kind of joking around about what we could do, you know, can we get like a bear or something like that on Red Square. And, um, the student was like, oh, I have a unicycle and I have a clown suit. And then somehow, like a couple weeks later, we were standing out on Red Square with a guy unicycling around with a clown suit. So. Well, for me, there, there are two really important aspects of the findings here. One is just how bad cell phones make you. Um, even on something as simple as walking, cell phones disrupt it, that you're substantially uh, slower, you change directions more, you weave more, you're just not able to, to get there. Um, you're also less likely to notice important stimuli. In a car, it's even worse. Uh, because there are other cars, there are <laughs> unicyclists out there, there are pedestrians out there. Um, you, you need to be aware of these things. The other thing that's really interesting here is that people think they're doing fine. They get across Red Square and you ask them if they see anything unusual and they, they don't say, no, I don't think so. And then you say, did you see a unicycling clown? And they're surprised that they could have missed it. Um, I noticed the signs and the people uh, for, um, for, I guess it's like AS, uh, and I noticed the Give Blood umbrella, and I noticed the blood truck. Oh, I was on my phone, wasn't I? Is that part of it? Yeah. No, I did not notice anything usual on the campus. Um, no. <laughs> no. Um, I think our results are particularly telling um, about how dangerous it could be to talk on a cell phone while driving. Driving, most of us have been doing since we were, you know, 16, maybe 15 and a half. Um, walking, I would say the majority of us have been practicing since we were like one. And yet, even with an activity so practiced and so familiar, people still had their performance affected by talking on the cell phone. Um, I figure now that if a conversation is important enough, that I need to answer it while I'm driving, it's important enough to pull over for. Kira McKenzie understands the dangers of talking on a phone while driving. Drivers who use cell phones in the car are four times more likely to crash and have been shown to be as impaired as drunk drivers. Hopefully, studies producing such irrefutable evidence will convince people that when they're on the road, they should leave their phone alone. seen him in James Bond. So, James, a James Bond movie. <laughs> well, what else has he been in? Hold on, he's been like 007. And then like, yeah, and it's like the same character in a different movie. It's like, got some people and have some sex. I can't think of one movie he's in right now, but I can picture him. He's in that movie where they steal the paintings. Um, that's a good one. I don't know yet. This is my first year here. So, let's wait and see. Yes, yes. definitely. Big growing stage in my yeah. life. Yeah, it's huge. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Whew. Um, it, I think it depends on the person. Um, some people, I think, after high school, they're totally ready to go out in the world and uh, and don't need to go to college, but then there are some people who 
could use like sort of the experience and the uh, like knowledge building base first. Yeah, I think it depends on the person. Tuition may be high, but man, the experiences and the people you meet and just the classes you get out of it are really something that's worth it. For those people who are determined to get something out of it, those people who are not determined to make most out of the college is a waste of time, waste of money, waste of resources. got to accomplish as much as you can. I don't think there's really one thing in particular. I don't really want to write my bucket list yet. That seems a little gross. Can I say anything I want on this? Or... <laughs> <laughs> I want to jump out of a plane before I die. I don't know if it's an accomplishment or not. But it's like the one thing that I like need to do. I want to accomplish everything else. Besides yeah. <laughs> Besides that? Yeah. I'm not really crazy You're not a plane. jumper. Obtaining an internship is one of the most beneficial things for Western students. Having the opportunity to intern at a local Bellingham business or organization is even more special. These three Western students are using their internship as a stepping stone towards landing their dream career. My name is Emily Green and I intern with the Bellingham Bells Baseball Club. I've learned a lot about how a baseball team is run and everything that goes into it. It is a small business and so I've learned a lot about that and promotions and what sponsorships consist of and how that's a major revenue generating piece of a baseball team. I think that knowing like the inner workings of a baseball team and especially at this level where I can kind of have my hand in everything, not just the marketing aspect of it, that'll really help. I write all the game scripts for every game and I choose what between inning promotions we do and everything and so that's I'm not the most creative person in the world and so that's kind of stretched me a little bit it's really taken me out of my comfort zone and I like that a lot I hope to work for a professional sports team whether that's baseball or the NFL or hockey or something like that I've always been really interested in sports <laughs> I'm Chuck Van Zee. I'm the volunteer coordinator with the Spark Museum of Electrical Invention, formerly the American Museum of Radio and Electricity. Basically, as a volunteer coordinator, I, I deal with the various uh, interns. I make sure they're all on task. They're kind of doing what they're supposed to be doing. I was very happy to have an internship here because, first of all, it's exactly what I wanted to be doing. Um, it's a lot of administrative. It's, it's educationally involved. But then it's, it's very community-oriented. So it's nice to be with a group that is so... that does so much with the community and then you know you get to meet everybody i mean everybody here is volunteer or from western washington so there's a lot a lot of community activity before i did my uh, master of education i did uh, i did my undergraduate in history and anthropology so i mean at this place it's awesome i mean it's history and it's culture i mean because it's how uh, radio and electricity affected the culture of you know the united states and so i mean it kind of blends all my interests together i got the educational administration side of it but in a field that I love. My name is Sarah Kane and I am an event coordinating intern with the Downtown Langham Partnership. I've been helping plan Downtown Sounds. It's the summer concert series that takes place on Bay Street. I'm in charge of band hospitality, so I make sure that like the bands have parking spaces, they're fed, uh, basically that they're happy before they go on stage. And then I also help with event actual execution and takedown. I've definitely learned that event planning takes a lot of time, that there's definitely more that goes into it behind the scenes you just have to roll with the punches and that things are going to go wrong and you just have to adapt like as as like problems happen ideally i think i would just want to work at a pr firm one 
that does do event planning. I don't know if it's something that I want to do exclusively. But Bellingham was a really good place for me to go. And I don't know if I have the actual experience yet to go like put my skills to use like in a bigger city like in Seattle. But um, this was this was a really good option for me. I know that I'm getting really good experience and I know that this is going to look good on my resume, but it's it's honestly, it's really fun just to get to go hang out at a concert all day. I mean, I'm not getting paid, but I get to hang out with cool people and it's, it's a lot of fun. I picked the right major. I really enjoy what I'm doing. Whether you're a marketing major, graduate student, or studying journalism, internships give you the opportunity to get involved with your community while gaining professional experience. My name is Michael J, and I'm um, a resident here in Bellingham, Washington, in the Geneva area, and I've been a member of the League of Women Voters for about seven years. I've interacted with people from the farms and people from, um, from uh, uh, the academia around issues where they often don't come together, and you really get a chance to understand a variety of different perspectives and make a more informed decision. Where I have seen engagement by young people, I think they've been very, very involved, and uh, I think that a lot of younger people feel disenfranchised, they really don't understand um, how uh, the vote really does represent them. I think my vote, personally, my individual vote is worth far less than the impact that I have on others who come to me and we discuss the issues and really engage in a meaningful fashion. I can impact so many more people, I can impact the community, and I think it's a chance for young people to see themselves as part of their generation as a community who's still going to be defining um, uh, the world that they're going to be living in. What can you do with a broken umbrella and an empty chip bag besides throw them away? <laughs> the Western Office of Sustainability, in partnership with the local community group Resources, posed that exact question to clothing designers. The annual trash fashion show challenges fashionistas to make a recycling fashion statement. <laughs> At the 10th annual Trash Fashion Show, garbage was given a second life. Put on by the ReStore and Office of Sustainability, designers showed you don't have to go to a mall to find fashion. It could be sitting in a dumpster right now. And it's amazing how people can create beautiful things out of garbage. <laughs> the work is becoming extremely high quality to, to the point where it's it's club ready now <laughs> you think trash fashion show and you might think of okay you pick something out of a dumpster and you kind of taped it on you I mean it almost needs a different name because none of that looks like trash it's amazing what they come up with and the ingenuity and creativity behind these designs makes me really proud. They've really put their heart and soul into it. The most exciting part, I think, is for people to realize that, well, that's trash. That's just bubble wrap and a tarp, or what? That, that's just Dorito bags, or, oh my goodness, that was, those were bicycle inner tubes, you know? And so I think that that really blows away every single person in the audience to realize what, what these outfits are made out of. There aren't a lot of designers here, but I happen to be one of them, and I think it was absolutely wonderful to work with garbage because I can make an outfit in two hours, which traditional fabrics could take me a whole lot longer. industrial design students had a, amazing designs and I think taking you know their 
ideas and their skills and producing wearable, recycled art is such a, a, a great product for what they're learning. All of this amazing student work where people are trying to beef up their portfolios and it's a class project, they're getting graded on it, so they go in some ways even, even more above and beyond the work that, that uh, designers who are doing it out of their love of it. We have a commitment to zero waste on our campus and I think anytime we can have a, an event like this that engages students, staff, faculty, and the community, it only helps to enhance that, that commitment towards zero waste and through that help us reach that goal. Our goal is really to inspire people to take another look at what is this before I throw it away? How else can I turn it into something beautiful or useful or weird or funky or whatever it is, you know, there's a lot of different ways that trash is really, really a treasure. So we say, what's in your treasure can? You know? Well, that wraps this episode of Western Window, but be sure to join us next time as we find out more about our world at and around Western Washington University.